Hello, this is Adam Tyson, MD from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Today we're going to talk about Group B Strep, um, or GBS. And in particular, we're going to talk about strategies to screen for GBS and to treat in the obstetric setting. The treatment is going to be largely based on IV antibiotics. I'm going to refer a number of times throughout this to the CDC. They have their recommendations on their website at cdc.gov slash group B strep slash index html. This is the source for um, the information I'm giving today, and it's also a great place to look at the algorithms for specific clinical situations like preterm labor, PPROM. It also has the references for newborn uh, treatment recommendations. So this is a good reference to keep in mind. Group B strep is a significant um, neonatal pathogen. It's responsible for a lot of cases of sepsis, pneumonia, meningitis. It's common. It is present in about 15 to 40 percent of women in their genital and GI tracts. And prior to the institution of widespread screening treatment, it accounted for 1.7 cases per thousand live births of sepsis. With effective screening and treatment, though, we've managed to get this down to about 0.34 to 0.37 cases per, per thousand live births. So our, our screening and awareness has really been effective. So um, moving on, who are we going to screen? CDC recommends that we screen all pregnant women and that this should be done between 35 and 37 weeks in each pregnancy. This is because it's, each culture is good for about five weeks, and we want to make sure that we carry the women uh, through to their expected delivery date. Now, there will be a few exceptions to this. You may want to screen earlier in a patient that you expect to deliver earlier. There are a couple of cases where you might not screen. They're fairly limited, though. If you've had a patient who has a positive urine culture that grew group B strep uh, at any time during the pregnancy, you do not need to screen her. And if you have a patient who had a previous newborn who had GBS illness, then you don't screen. Now those are really just a couple, you know, a couple of small exceptions. Everyone else does need to be screened. Um, by screening, I primarily mean culture. This is a vaginal rectal uh, culture. There is a nucleic acid amplification test which is available in some centers. Um, however, it's not available everywhere, whereas culture uh, will be present in most hospitals. And here at Greenville Health System, we actually don't use the nucleic acid test, so I'm not going to talk about that as much. Uh, specifics about that though are in the CDC's website. You can look at that if you would like more information about those. So, once we've identified the patients through screening, we do need to treat. There's going to be a few other patients that we treat as well. So, you're going to treat anybody with a positive screen. You're going to treat anyone who had a positive urine culture or a prior newborn with GBS disease because those women are considered to be at high enough risk for recurrence of the disease that screening is um, not necessary. You don't want to miss by having a false negative. They've already proven they're at high risk due to either high colony count or prior disease, so we're just going to treat them. We're also going to treat a few other women because occasionally you're going to have a patient come in with either an unknown screen result 
or no screening at all. And in those cases, we're going to use um, risk factors. Now, the risk factors we use are any preterm labor. And by that, I mean less than 37 completed weeks of gestation. This would also include PPROM. Any woman with prolonged rupture of membranes, even at term, with a negative, or excuse me, with a unknown culture, and any woman with an intrapartum fever. And we're going to say that that's a temperature of 100.4 Fahrenheit or 38 centigrade. These women are also going to be at high risk to have uh, group B strep, and if any of these should show up in a woman who has an unknown um, culture, then you're going to add treatment. Now, is there anyone you're not going to treat with a positive culture? Very small subset. If a woman is going to have a C-section, and this is a planned C-section delivery, and her membranes are intact, and she's not in labor. Then this is one who, even in the face of a positive culture, you don't treat. Another case of not treating is going to be if a woman has a negative culture, but then goes on to develop a risk factor or she has a historical risk factor like preterm labor you still don't treat in this case and it's all because of the negative culture so remember these risk factors apply only in cases of unknown GBS status Now, I mentioned that the mainstay of therapy is IV antibiotics. And this is important because some people have done research using vaginal uh, chlorhexidine douches or other topical antibiotics. Those have shown some promise in that they have reduced the colony counts in the vagina, but no one's ever proven that you can prevent disease in the newborn this way. So IV antibiotics are going to be our primary treatment. and Primarily, it's going to be penicillin G. This is the one we rely on in most cases. The dose is 5 million units initially, and then 3 million every four hours until delivery. Some people will use ampicillin as an alternative to this. In cases of penicillin allergy, which is fairly common, um, you have to get some history. Is the patient at high risk for anaphylaxis? If the answer is no, if they just had a minor rash, then you can use cefazolin. If the answer is yes, then you have to either get susceptibilities, in which case you might use Clinda or erythromycin, but if you have no susceptibilities, then you have to use vancomycin. The reason for this is that resistance to clindamycin or erythromycin is about 30% in some cases. So vancomycin is going to be your best bet for treating your unknown, um, or correction, your GBS positive patient or your patient who meets the the criteria for risk factor treatment 
who has a penicillin allergy, which is serious, but in whom you don't know the susceptibilities. The susceptibilities are a little bit tricky because a patient's isolate can be susceptible in vitro to clindamycin, however, in fact, be resistant to it in vivo. And there's a second test that needs to be run for what's called inducible clindamycin resistance. And unless this two-step test has been performed, because of this 30% resistance rate. That's why you need to use the vancomycin. Our goal in treating with antibiotics is that we want to have a total of four hours between uh, delivery and the time you gave the antibiotics. So this is your magic number, four hours of treatment. CDC does go on to say, however, that you shouldn't delay delivery or delay any necessary procedures in order to achieve this four hours. If the patient labors fast, she labors fast. The take home message really is just get your antibiotics in as quickly as you can to try to allow for the um, adequate treatment. Again, please refer to cdc.gov if you have any further questions uh, about specific cases or if you would like to read the full algorithms and the rationale behind the uh, creation of these algorithms. You can also find the recommendations for newborn treatment there, which I haven't gone into, and any other information you would like about uh, nucleic acid amplification testing. Thanks for your time.